Welcome to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the content director at Word on Fire. Unfortunately, Bishop Robert Barron is not with us today in the studio. He is taking a well-deserved break, but we didn't want to leave you hanging. So this week, we decided to share with you a talk that Bishop Barron recently gave titled, David Dancing Before the Ark. It, of course, features David, that main figure in First and Second Samuel, Bishop Barron, you might remember, recently completed a commentary on the book of 2 Samuel. It was part of the Brazos Theological Commentary series. And so this talk covers some of the main contours of Bishop Barron's commentary. If you don't already have your copy of that book, the commentary on 2 Samuel, now's a great chance to get it because we have a special deal for you. If you visit our website, wordonfire.org slash Samuel, that'll take you right to the book page for this 2 Samuel commentary. And then if you use the coupon code SAM5 at the checkout, you'll receive $5 off the copy of the book. So again, go to wordonfire.org slash Samuel and use the coupon code SAM5, S-A-M-5, to save $5 on your copy of Bishop Barron's commentary. This week, we'll listen to the first half of Bishop Barron's talk, and next week, we'll be back with the conclusion. So sit back and enjoy this talk from Bishop Barron on David Dancing Before the Ark. What I want to share with you this afternoon is a chapter from a book that's coming out in 2015. Uh, Brazos Press is bringing out a whole set of uh, biblical commentaries, but written not so much by biblical specialists as by um, theologians, in a conscious attempt to bring a more patristic style of analysis to uh, to the scripture. Um, they asked me to do 2 Samuel a while ago, and I was privileged to do so, delighted to do so. Uh, I became rector midway through the process, so it slowed things down quite a bit. But the book is now finished. It'll be coming out in 2015. I'm going to read to you essentially one of the chapters of that book. Um, I have written a little introductory paragraph. The talk will end abruptly. I didn't really write a conclusion. It's just the way the chapter is going to end. So I just want to warn you in advance. There'll be a somewhat abrupt ending to things. Uh, the general topic is David's dance before the ark and what that says about uh, worship and uh, the praise of God. So 1 and 2 Samuel constitute one of the truly great documents that's come down to us from the ancient world. Its theological significance is obvious, but it also stands out as a literary masterpiece, marked by narrative subtlety, rich elusiveness, chiastic structuring, and remarkable poetic beauty. Moreover, its portraits of Samuel, Saul, Joab, and especially David the king are among the most psychologically perceptive and humanly affecting in all of ancient literature. What I want to do in this paper is to concentrate on a particularly vivid moment in the career of David, namely the king's conquest of Jerusalem and his conveyance of the Ark of the Covenant into his new capital. The episode is of considerable historical interest, of course, but it's also a hinge moment in the development of a distinctively Israelite theology of worship. As such, it functions as an anticipation of the new and definitive David, who roughly a thousand years later would give his father perfect worship in that same city. With the defeat of the Philistines in the Valley of Rephaim, David's consolidation of kingly leadership was, from a political standpoint, more or less complete. He had emerged as the new Adam, that's to say, leader of a properly defended Eden. But there was more to Adam than kingliness. The first man was presented by the rabbis of the intertestamental period and by the church fathers as priest as well as king. Walking in easy fellowship with Yahweh, Adam was naturally in the stance of adoration, a word derived from adoratio, ad ora, literally, to the mouth. To adore is to be mouth to mouth with God, breathing in the divine life and breathing out praise. We might see in the opening line of the Song of Songs, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, not only a cry of erotic desire, but a longing of the soul for worship. Mouth to mouth, one is also reconciled to God, literally eyelash to eyelash with him. So aligned, everything in the worshiper becomes properly ordered, harmonized like the medallions of a rose window around the center. In the attitude of adoration, Adam was, accordingly, the first priest, and the ordered garden that surrounded him was construed, again by the rabbis and the fathers, as a primordial temple. Right praise, orthodoxy literally, leads to the right ordering of the one who gives praise, and it also conduces toward the right ordering of the family, 
the community, the society, the cosmos that surrounds him. In this context, perhaps we can understand a remark often associated with Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, the co-founders of the Catholic Worker Movement, namely that cult cultivates the culture. Business, finance, politics, the arts, entertainment, etc., all find their proper place and realize their proper finality when they're grounded in the praise of God. According to liturgical prayer, glory to God in the highest and an earth peace to people of goodwill. One can read that not only as a word of praise, but also as a kind of formula. When glory is given to God above all things, then peace tends to break out among us. We've seen the original sin could be appreciated as a result of bad kingly leadership on the part of the first king, but in light of these clarifications just made, it might be appreciated too as the suspension of right praise, as the consequence of a failure in priesthood. When they listened to the voice of the serpent and disobeyed the command of God, Adam and Eve fell out of the stance of adoration and it ordered their hearts away from the unconditioned good. This led to the interior disintegration, the falling apart of mind from flesh, soul from body, intention from action, etc. It also gave rise, as we saw, to the disintegration of community and the alienation from nature. The expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden should be interpreted accordingly, not as a sentence passed by an insulted deity, but rather as the inevitable consequence of bad praise. When something other than God is given glory in the highest, the garden turns into a desert. We might therefore read the entirety of the biblical narrative as the story of God's attempts to lure his people back into orthodoxy. Not as though God needs such devotion, but precisely because such devotion is tantamount to human flourishing. When sin resulted in the destruction of the entirety of the created order, according to the biblical narrative, God sent a rescue operation in the form of a great ship on which a microcosm of Eden could be preserved. This is why Noah, again, was read by the fathers as a priestly figure, presiding over a tiny remnant where right praise was practiced. Once the floodwaters had receded, Noah the priest offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and allowed the good order he had preserved to flood the world, reconstituting it as a temple. As Yahweh shaped his people Israel, he consistently coupled covenant with sacrificial worship. Thus, Abram, having heard the promise that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars, was asked to sacrifice five animals to the Lord, cutting their bodies in two. Moses received the word of Yahweh on Sinai and then slaughtered bulls and sprinkled their blood on the altar and on the people. In Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, we hear detailed prescriptions governing the offering of sacrifice to the Lord, oblations that took place in a tabernacle or tent sanctuary accompanying the wandering people in the desert. Why would the worship that Yahweh demanded be sacrificial in form? Prior to the fall, adoration would have been effortless. But after the tumble into sin, right praise comes only at a cost. This is because heterodoxy, bad praise, had twisted the human person out of shape, setting mind against will, body against spirit, etc. To recover one's spiritual equilibrium, therefore, was necessarily painful. When someone brought an animal to the tabernacle and later to the temple for sacrifice, he was saying implicitly that what was happening to the animal should, by rights, be happening to him. Now, as we know, at the heart of the tab tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant, the gold-plated box of acacia wood, which housed the remnants of the tablets of the law, the rod of Aaron, and some pieces of manna, all reminders of the Exodus journey and the Sinai Covenant. This Ark became the focus of Israelite worship, both a sign of Yahweh's presence among his people and a pledge of the people's obedience. Like Noah's Ark, it was a microcosm of Eden, creation rightly ordered around the praise of God, which is precisely why the Ark was carried by Israel into battle. In the book of Numbers we hear, quote, Whenever the Ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and your foes flee before you, close quote. The task of the kingly and priestly people of Israel was to Edenize the world, and hence they would carry this emblem of Eden before them when they met the enemies of Yahweh. One of the central tragedies of Israelite history is described in 1 Samuel, the loss of the ark during a disastrous battle with the Philistines. Quote, so the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated and they fled, everyone to his home. There was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. 
That's 1 Samuel 4, 10, and 11. This represented a colossal failure of the kingly and priestly mission of Israel, the collective Adam. But in the somewhat comical section of 1 Samuel, known as the Ark Narrative, we see that the power of the true God is greater than that of the false gods that can beguile the human heart. When the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the house of Dagon, the shrine to the god, gods of the Philistines, the idols collapse before it. Quote, but when they rose early on the next morning, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord, of course, in the attitude of worship. This is much more than an affirmation of one particular ancient Middle Eastern god being more powerful than another. It's a showing forth of this absolutely central theme that human flourishing is a consequence of right praise. The central battle of Israel's God is always against idolatry, for everything that's dysfunctional in the human heart and society flows finally from that primordial skewing. In this regard, the story of the ark's triumph over Dagon is not unlike the account in 1 Kings of Elijah's victory over the priests of Baal. Now, this brief overview provides, uh, however inadequately, a background for the decisively important sixth chapter of 2 Samuel, at which point I'm going to take off my coat. <laughs> Having become king, David knows he must become a priest, for he's to preside over a liturgical kingdom. In the book of Exodus, we hear that Yahweh would form an orthodox nation, a people who worship a right. Quote, Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. It's Exodus 19.5. The prescriptions given to Moses and the sons of Aaron, as well as the mobile tabernacle with the ark, were the provisional means by which Yahweh was shaping his priestly people during the years of wandering and during the period of consolidation. But David intuited that these strands had to be gathered and that above all, the ark had to come to rest in his new capital city, providing thereby an unambiguous center for the nation, a still point around which all of its various elements could arrange themselves. And this is why David's establishment of the ark in Jerusalem represents a certain climax to the narrative that began with the fall and led to the formation of the priestly people, the cutting of covenants, the giving of the law, and the invasion of the promised land. Chapter 6 commences on a triumphant note, quote, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God. The king chose a veritable army of his best men in order to seize an apparently undefended piece of sacred furniture and bring it back to Jerusalem. What we're meant to see, of course, is the enormous importance that David attaches to this mission. As Polson, that's Robert Polson, one of the more... Uh, gifted commentators in this text. As Polson astutely remarks, we're also meant to hear an echo of the 30,000 who were lost when the ark was taken by the Philistines. Baal Judah, or Bala in Judah, is a synonym for Kiriath Yeraim, mentioned in 1 Samuel 7, and beautifully invoked in the 132nd Psalm. Quote, He, David, swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord. We heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Ya'ar. That's Psalm 132. This lyrical passage captures so well the holy obsession of David to ground and center his liturgical empire through right praise. In the account of this scene in First Chronicles, we hear that David consulted with the entire people before making this move and that they enthusiastically supported him. Hence we see the liturgical people gladly shaping themselves around the ark and around the priest king. The ark of the covenant, we are told, was in the house of Abinadab, an Israelite who presumably took it when it was returned by the Philistines many years before, convinced that it bore a curse. Abinadab's dwelling is said to be on a hill, which probably carries the implication of a holy place or shrine of some kind. What's of some interest is why, during the long years of Saul's reign in the Civil War, the Ark had been more or less forgotten. Was this perhaps emblematic of the fact that suspension of right worship and the dissolution of Israel always go hand in hand? Once he'd found the Ark, David endeavored to bring it back. He placed it, we hear, in a new cart, which is to say a cart that's never been used for any secular purpose, and he commences the journey back to Jerusalem. 
We then hear that Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were directing the cart and that David and his entourage were dancing with reckless abandon before the Ark of the Lord. When the festive liturgical procession reached the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and the Ark was jostled, so that Uzzah, innocently enough, reached out to steady it, at which point he was struck dead by an angry god, we hear. Now, there's probably no story in 2 Samuel that puzzles and irritates a contemporary reader more than this one. To conceive of God's ark as the bearer of a deadly electric charge or to conceive of God as a cruel tyrant capable of an utterly disproportionate reaction to a minor and unintentional liturgical infraction seems at best primitive and at worst dangerous. Much of the liberal enlightened theologizing of the last 200 years, in fact, militates against this sort of construal of God's relationship with humanity. The problem for liberal theology, of course, is that this story in 2 Samuel is hardly egregious. The Bible is filled with accounts of God's anger, God's justice, and God's punishment. And often enough, the biblical authors present a divine retribution, which appears, at least to us, disproportionate and exaggerated. So, what sense can we make of it? The one who created the whole of the cosmos, the heavens and the earth, in more scriptural terminology, cannot be determined by any limitations or ontological conditions that circumscribe creatures. The one who gives the entirety of the being of the world cannot, for example, be characterized as standing in need of any further existential realization. This in turn entails the immutability of the creator. It's crucially important to note this has nothing to do with God being cold or indifferent to the world that he's made. Rather, God's immutability means that God cannot change in a creaturely way, which is to say in the manner of a finite being moving beyond its limits towards some greater perfection of being. From God's unchangeability, we can deduce that God does not pass in and out of emotional states, shifting as we do from contentment to discontentment, from joy to anger, from anticipation to disappointment, etc. As the author of 1 John clarifies, God is love, implying the very to be of God is identical with the stance and attitude of love. Mutable as we are, we creatures fall in and out of love. We love to varying degrees. We love and then we don't love. But this can't be the case in regard to the God who stands beyond the ontological vagaries of the created realm. But how does this divine love manifest itself? To answer that question adequately, we have to be clear about what love is. For the mainstream of the theological and spiritual tradition, love is not an emotion or sentiment, but rather the act of willing the good of the other as other. But this means that love will express itself in a variety of ways, depending upon the object of love. If I love someone who's on a self-destructive path, my willing of his good will undoubtedly appear as harsh, angry, even punitive, for I'm trying to get that person rightly aligned. Therefore, God's anger in the Bible might be construed as a symbolic expression of God's passion to set things right. We might think of God's love as a pure white light, which upon passing through the prism of creation history breaks into a variety of colors. The language of the biblical authors, drawn as it must be from psychology and general experience, gestures analogically toward the various ways the one divine love manifests itself in the world. As we all know, storytellers tend to express themselves in bold and exaggerated ways, and the biblical narrators are no exceptions. To give just two examples, think of the ages of the patriarchs and the number of warriors mustered for or killed in battle. Thus, when they want to gesture toward the divine passion to set things right, they will often present God, a God raging in anger or burning with indignation, even putting thousands to death. We shouldn't literalize this language either historically or psychologically. Instead, we should construe it as a poetic indication of the dark face of a love, which remains essentially mysterious to us. With those clarifications in mind, let's return to this particular story of Uzzah and the Ark of the Covenant. Why would Yahweh be angry at Uzzah's attempt to prevent the sacred Ark from falling to the ground? The key issue seems to be liturgical impropriety. In Exodus 25, we hear of God's explicit instruction regarding the construction of the ark. Quote, You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark by which to carry the ark. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. Close quote. That's Exodus 25, 13 to 15. God wanted the ark designed in a very particular way, and he ordained it to be carried in a very particular way. The principal problem with David's first attempt to carry the ark into his capital city is that he was hauling it by cart rather than carrying it by the poles. 
It was this faster but more precarious form of transport that caused the Ark to tip and Uzzah to react. Now, once more, we're sorely tempted to conclude that a god who'd respond with deadly violence to such a minor violation of liturgical law is surely a tad unbalanced. Yet, we have to keep the symbolic nature of the language in mind and get to the spiritual truths the author is endeavoring to communicate. The entire purpose of liturgy is to restore humanity to right order, adoratio leading to the harmonizing of self and society, as we've seen. Over the course of many centuries, Yahweh had been forming his people in the ways of orthodoxy. And at the heart of this right praise is a decentering of the self, a twisting away from the ego and a turning toward God. As we saw, the founder of Israel, Abraham, was a man who listened to God and the whole of Israelite life, covenant, worship, prophecy, etc., was a systematic attempt to help the people to listen, to attend to the Lord. Hence, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is Lord alone, the famous Shema in Deuteronomy 6. It was indeed more convenient to convey the ark by means of an ox cart, but the Lord had instructed it to be carried by poles. A small matter, perhaps, but obedience, listening, is the hinge on which Israelite life turns. God was angry, not because Uzzah's act personally offended him. In point of fact, the one who needs nothing from the world cannot even in principle be offended, but rather because it represented a compromising of the liturgical attitude. Now the church fathers, whom I'm imitating here, are eminently clear on this score. Chrysostom says, quote, As the wrath of God was drawn down on Uzzah for intruding on an office that was not his own, so God's wrath will likewise advance against those who subvert the gospel. Salvian remarks, quote, Uzzah's punishment for studying the ark shows that nothing may be considered lightly when it pertains to God. And finally, Pacian of Barcelona comments, quote, so great a concern was there of reverence toward God that God did not accept bold hands even out of help. Close quote. There's another theological theme that emerges from this odd tale, which is worthy of some careful consideration, namely that of the divine inscrutability and sublimity. The creator of the universe cannot, as we saw, be categorized in any conventional philosophical system. God cannot be deftly defined or set in easy contrast to other beings or states of affairs. Thomas Aquinas catches the sheer strangeness of God when he comments that God is not in any genus, even the genus of being. Further, the providential range of God includes the whole of creation, which means the totality of time and space. And all this implies that God's activities and purposes in the world will necessarily remain inscrutable to a finite mind. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways, says Paul in Romans 11. The strangeness of God and his actions have nothing to do with capriciousness on God's part, but it's rather a function of God's absolutely unique manner of being and our limited consciousness. The author of the book of Job, of course, makes much the same point in his magnificently constructed dialogue between a frustrated human sufferer and the providential lord of the entire cosmos. We might utilize a Kantian conceptual framework and speak of the sublimity of God, which is to say God's overwhelming of the human sensorium and intellect. Hans von Baltzar spoke of a God, spoke of God as a raging alpine torrent, which utterly smashes any receptors designed to channel it and convert it to human use. The divine sublimity is by turns thrilling and terrifying. The prophet Isaiah can exult in the overwhelming beauty of God manifested in a temple vision of clouds and angels. But as a letter of the Hebrews has it, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. A one-sided stress on the latter quality gives us an arbitrary God, but a unilateral stress on the former gives us a superficial and manipulable God. Without for a moment rescinding any of the clarifications made above, I would simply say this, Yahweh's striking down of Uzzah is finally inexplicable. It's a symbolic expression, if you want, of the sublimity of God. Thanks again for listening to the first half of this talk from Bishop Robert Barron. Don't forget that next week we'll be back with the second half, in the meantime, again, visit wordonfire.org slash Samuel, where you can pick up your copy of Bishop Barron's full commentary on the book of 2 Samuel, and use the coupon code SAM5, that's S-A-M-5, to save $5 when you order the book today. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week on the Word on Fire show. Word on Fire.